Hello, my name is Cole Worley and I'm the designer of John Company. This is the first video in a series of videos we're going to be doing about the gameplay. In this video, I want to offer everyone a, just a general primer on how John Company works. Now, John Company is a little bit different from other games that I've worked on. Um, if a group is comfortable not knowing every single little intricacy and implication of play, the game is actually sort of built to teach you how to play as you play. So it's my hope that with a video like this, uh, if you have one person at your table who knows the game pretty well, everybody else could just watch this little overview video and you'll have a pretty good sense to play and you can get, you can get right into the action as soon as possible. So let's get started. Uh, this is John Company. Uh, on, and I'll be using the Tabletop Simulator mod, uh, which we'll be releasing uh, with the Kickstarter. Now, one thing I should mention right at the start is that John Company is still in development. It's quite far along. It's almost done. But uh, we will be making sure that these videos are marked with the Kickstarter uh, version. And after the game does finish its publication, we will take all these videos down and replace them with new videos. So uh, when you boot up the game, it won't quite look like this. Uh, what I've gone ahead and done is set up the 17 scenario, a 1710 scenario for three players, which you can see here. Now, what's this game about? John Company is a game about prestige. It's a game about power and reputation and how you get it. And it takes the view, it takes the perspective of English families who were trying to sort of work their way up higher into the aristocracy by using the East India Company over the course of the 18th and 19th century. In the game, players take the roles of different families. Here's the Walsh family, for instance. Uh, and there are a few things that families have. Uh, the most important thing they have is they have a big supply of children. Now, each one of these uh, little cameos is unique, but uh, all the children are basically the same. They're just, they're just different player pieces. A family also has a treasury, which you can see using this counter. This family has six pounds. Uh, of, of course, in reality, um, this is maybe a thousand times that in terms of the family's wealth. Uh, families also have a little set of promises. Now, these are things that you're welcome to use when you negotiate in, in the game. Now, John Company is a negotiation game, and almost everything in the game is tradable, including promises that you'll do something in the future, which are represented with these promise cards. Uh, families, you'll see, also have their pieces on the board. Now, the way this works is you can see here on the bottom of the board a row of pieces, and each one of the family pieces is next to a title. Those titles are the office positions being held by the different family members. So, for instance, this yellow piece right here is the chairman. The director of trade is being held by the blue player, and the green player is holding the shipping office. Now, John Company is a business game and a negotiation game, but one of the things that separates it from a lot of other business and negotiation games is that all the players collectively control one enterprise, and they hold their power over the enterprise by occupying these offices. Now, over the course of the game, uh, office holders will someday retire. So, for instance, let's say the director of trade re retires. That will make them a pensioner for the turn, and during the London season phase, they are going to attempt to score one of these estates. Now, the estates are your most critical way. These prizes are the most critical way to gain victory points in the game. You'll note every prize has in the top left a price. That's how much it costs to occupy that estate. So if you want to restore this old castle, it's going to cost you 14 pounds. It's a lot of money. And that's not all the money you'll end up paying. You'll note that in the top right, there's an expense value, and that needs to be paid every single turn if you want to keep your family member, this pensioner right here, occupying this prize. If you cannot pay that value, you lose your pensioner, and the pensioner is out of the game, and you also lose the victory points associated with this prize. Now, in John Company, seven victory points is a lot. Uh, there can be winning scores as low as one or two points. So if you can score a high-value prize, you might be able to write it to the win. Now, the other reason you want to score prizes is that when you score prizes, you get access to cards on the London season. So what happens here is that when you go in, after everyone's scored prizes, you'll be able to take turns based on how much money you just spent buying these cards. So for instance, here we have a rotten borough. This will give you influence in elections. Here's a foundry, which changes your uh, your options for making money, and then a Scottish 
castle, which is just worth a bunch of these prestige points, which are framed with this fancy frame. Now, prestige points are another way of scoring points in the game. Uh, at the end of the game, the player with the most prestige points will get some extra victory points. The player or players with the least will lose victory points. So you never want to have the lowest amount of prestige. Uh, and if you can, you want to try to get the highest. Now, there are other cards in this prestige deck, including secret prestige cards. Now, these secret prestige cards, if they're out here in the market uh, and it's your turn to pick, you are allowed to peek at the prestige cards. These prestige cards will give you an alternate way of scoring victory points, or sometimes they'll allow you to hatch kind of nefarious schemes and perform powerful single use actions. Now, I did mention that pretty much everything in the game is tradable. And so, for instance, if you find yourself buying the Scottish castle and later you have a hard time making your expenses, you might sell this to this card to another player in hopes that you can make ends meet and then maybe come back on top. All right, so that's just a little overview of how re retirement works. Now, the other thing you have to know is these family members are going to travel a lot in, in the game. So, for instance, maybe after the director of trade re retires, um, during a later phase of the game, that position will be filled by another one of these positions. In this case, the director of trade is hired from people who already have offices. So, for instance, this piece right here might come to occupy the new director of trade. And now the Madras pro presidency is empty. And so one of these uh, two writers in these, this writer's box will come to occupy that position. So you can see how you can kind of climb this corporate ladder as the game progresses. Now, there are just a couple other notes that I want to mention about the game generally. And remember, this isn't a full rules overview. I'll be doing one of those too. I just want to give a general overview to the whole thing. Uh, so the biggest thing I want to do right now is show you what the board looks like and how it works. So John Company is a procedural game, and that means each turn you're going to start over here in the London season. Uh, this phase is skipped on the first turn, but you're going to start over here, and then you're going to progress through these different phases. And though there are many phases in this game, many of them are very, very simple. Uh, so you'll start with the London season. You'll then do your family phase. This is where you get new children and you assign them to do various things. In the stock buy section, children who are in the stock exchange might come to serve on the court of directors. The court of directors is the governing body of the company. And each one of these children occupying the spot represents one share, uh, one block of shares in the company. After we do stock buys, if there are any vacant offices, we fill them during the hiring phase. And then the company begins to act. It starts with the chairman who seeks debt and tries to allocate the money across these company treasuries. Now you'll notice that while you have a, your own personal family treasury here, there are also five treasuries on the board. These are budget allotments. Um, that go along with several of the different company offices. So during the chairman's phase, they spend down the company balance and then use that balance to increase the different uh, earmarked amounts. After that, we go to the director of trade. They're responsible for special envoys to open up new regions to trade, and they also get to adjust you know, positions. So for example, that they can transfer a low level writer from one part of, the, of India to another. They could also transfer a ship to service in a different part of the Indian Ocean. The shipping office is responsible for buying new, new ships and determining the basic ship building uh, strategy of the company. Uh, military affairs is like the director of trade, but they get to allocate offices across the army. So for example, if the army is worried about uh, an impending attack in Bengal, the military affairs office could transfer regiments over here. Now you'll notice I'm moving these little black disks. Uh, which are used in the game in a different way. The black disc is a contextual piece. It means different things in different places. So in this instance, it means a regiment because it's sitting in an army. Over here on the board, uh, a black piece on, an, on one of these circles represents a closed order. If an order, which is a circle with a number in it, doesn't have a token on it, it's an open order and can be traded with. Now we move on to the three presidencies. Now you'll notice over here that there are these three presidencies. There's the Bombay Presidency, based in Bombay, uh, the Madras Presidency, based in Madras, and the Bengal Presidency, based in Bengal. Each of these presidents, so in order to facilitate uh, trade in India, the East India Company adopted a kind of like administrative zone system. 
uh, and divided India into kind of three big administrative zones for to ma help manage the trade. Uh, and then the game does the same thing. So we have the Bombay presidency has into its to its name uh, a small budget. It has some writers. It has a sea zone associated with it. This is the Arabian Sea, or the Western Ocean, um, and it, which might have boats in it. And then, of course, it has a home region, Bombay. The Madras presidency, likewise, is associated here, and the Bengal presidency is likewise associated here. Now, the, the presidencies are very important offices because they generate the bulk of the company's money, especially at the beginning of the game. And the way money is generated in this game is that the number of boats in a region is its trade bandwidth. The more boats that are in a region, the more orders it can fill. So here in the Bombay presidency, there's just a single ship. We'll see it right here, the Atlas. Um, and the Atlas can fill one order. Every ship can fill one order. So here we have one order right here that could be filled. And if the Bombay presidency chooses to trade and they fill that one order, they get to assign a writer so they could sign, for instance, yellow to fill this order. And then the company's balance increases by five and the order is filled. Now, if there were two ships, for instance, let's, here's the constant friend. If the constant friend were in this ocean and the president succeeded in trading, they would then throw another, uh, they could then fill another order. Now they can't fill these closed orders, but they could also fill this order in kind of up here near Rajasthan. Now, why am I putting pieces here? Well, these riders represent filled orders. So you use them to mark an order that's been filled. And at the end of the turn, they will come back to the rider box. But more importantly, there are some special bonuses that get paid out. So a president who fills orders gets one pound per order filled. So this president of Bombay is going to get a bonus of $2 because they fill, or two pounds because they filled two orders. Then every writer who gets assigned to an order also makes an additional pound of just kind of petty graft. So in this instance, yellow would get two pounds for filling two orders as president and one pound for having their own writer assigned. And blue, so it's for a total of three pounds, blue would only get one pound. All right, so all the presidents pretty much do the, the same thing. Uh, and th this little marker I'll just mention here as it kind of progresses along. If there are any governorships, these are offices that are created later, they act first. Then the commanders of the army get to, get, get to act. Uh, they can use their military force to uh, compel orders to be opened, and they can also conquer regions of India. And then we go to the, the Madras presidents, which get to manage the trade, as I've just described. Now, one thing that bears mentioning here is that doing business in India is risky. And almost every action in this game that has some amount of risk in it uses the exact same action system. And I'll describe how that works. So the action system works as follows. Uh, when you want to take an action, you will gather an amount of dice. Uh, usually, you have to spend money to get dice, and dice cost about a pound each. Then, uh, sometimes there are headwinds, there are bad things that, uh, that make your action more difficult, and that usually causes dice to be removed from the pool. So maybe I spent four pounds out of the presidential treasury to get these four dice, but there's something about it that makes my action uh, more difficult, so I remove one die. Uh, the actor then rolls the remaining dice, and if the lowest result is a one, so that then on looking at that dice pool, you use only the lowest result. If the lowest result was a one or a two, the action is successful. So you just need one success. If the lowest result is a three or a four, the action fails. But if you have more resources, you can, you can do it again. If the lowest action was a five or a six, if the lowest dice was a, a five or a six, it's a catastrophic failure. And not only does the action not happen, you are immediately dismissed from your post. Now, because this person might have one day gone on to serve in a, in a more prestigious position or to occupy a prize over here, getting fired is a big deal. And oftentimes you do not want to take an action that only rolls one or two dice because the chances of firing are so much higher. So after the presidencies have acted, we will do a variety of cleanup phases. So for example, during bonuses, you'll make money for your deeds. Now you'll note uh, every player has these office cards which correspond to the different offices that they might be holding. Players also have deeds. So this is a shipyard, this is the Atlas. And what this means is that the Walsh family here, Green, owns the Atlas. It's a ship that they built. It's in the company's service right now. It's on a long-term lease, but they hold the, the deed to the ship. 
And this deed, as long as the ship is in service, is going to generate one pound every turn. And that's paid out during the bonuses phase. The other types of deeds that make money are these workshops. Now, workshops, you'll note, have a question mark on their income. And the amount of money they're going to make is going to depend right here on the, how well the company does. If the company does really, really well, then workshops make less money. If the company does quite badly, then workshops are going to make more money. And why this is, is because you're competing. If you're a workshop owner, you're competing with, with the company. You're trying to sell people your Midland wool, woolens. And if there are fine Indian calicos coming in, uh, your business is going to be quite bad. But if the company struggles, your business will be pretty good. Uh, after that, the company has to pay revenue. And at this point, we adjust the company's balance to reflect its expenses. It has to pay a dollar for every ship. It has to pay an amount of money depending on the size of its military. It, you pay one for every player piece in these three boxes. Uh, so regiments don't count. And then you also have to pay money for any debt the company is currently taken out. After that, we resolve the events in India phase, which I'll talk about in a whole separate video. But basically, the way the events in India phase is, is you will roll this die, and that will determine where the storms are. So it's possible that ships could become destroyed and are returned to their shipyard or become fatigued and are more likely to be destroyed in future turns. It also, every one of these dice has a number on it, which determines how many of these event cards you flip. When you flip an event card, the event pictured happens in the region pictured. So this would be turmoil in Mysore that closes this order in Mysore. So you put a little black disc right on top of that order, and that would be the first event resolved, and you would resolve three events. At the end of the turn, we go to the Parliament Meets phase. During this phase, the Prime Minister is going to stew and try to hold their power by, passing a lot, by uh, bringing a law to Parliament that they think they can pass. Um, again, I'll be talking about this phase in a, in a future video, but just know that you're, you are going to vote on a law and get into some arguments. At the end of the turn, the, this marker is returned here to the London season, and then this is advanced. During the London season, you roll a die for every single office holder that you have, and there's a, small, there's a chance they retire, or they can become more fatigued, or they could stay healthy and in power. Unlike a lot of Euro games, you don't have full control over when your people retire. And this can be a very scary thing, but it can also mean that when you have your shot, you got to take it. And that, that can mean that you had to go to a fellow player and ask for huge amounts of debt. And that's part, part of the fun of the game. Now, the very last thing I want to mention is that there are two ways that the game can end. Uh, the game can end in a successful company where basically the company continued running the whole time. And when that happens, there's a bonus London season where players get one more shot at retirement. The game can also end in company failure. Now, there are a few ways the company can fail. Uh, its standing can fall. This is if it's not paying dividends and if it's doing irresponsible things in India, its standing will fall. Or uh, if the company has too much debt, this track will fill up with debt, and at this mark, when it uh, would, would put a debt here, the company also fails. Now, if the company fails, there is no final role for re retirement, and every share that you have in the court of directors, which would normally be worth a victory point, is now worth minus one victory points. So. In short, this is a game about steering your family through the company, and you're trying to use that power and prestige to score fancy prizes, to compete for ornaments on, in the London season, and to hopefully end up on top however the game manages to end. I hope, you've avoided, uh, I hope you enjoyed, it, enjoyed this video, and I hope it answered any questions you might have about the game. This wasn't a full teach. I'll be doing a full teach in a supplementary video. Uh, but I think that this hopefully should give players a sense of the scope of the game. And if at least one person at your table knows how to play, you could probably just hop in and start playing right away. Thank you very much.